All right, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for preparing students to improve drug therapy using a consistent patient care process. My name is Dana Timmons and I am a user services librarian for McGraw-Hill. Just a few housekeeping things before we get started. All lines have been muted, so please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your, of your screen to type in any questions that you have. I see a lot of people are already saying hello in the chat box, so welcome everyone. If you are experiencing any technical issues, please enter them into the chat box so we can help you troubleshoot. The session will be recorded. Everyone who registered for the session will receive a link to the recording. Now on to the event. I am thrilled to introduce the speakers. Dr. Joseph T. DePiro is Dean, Professor, and Archie O'Malley Chair at the Virginia Commonwealth University School of Pharmacy. Dr. DePiro is the past president of the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy and past chair of the Council of Deans and has served as the president of the American College of Clinical Pharmacy. He was the editor of the American Journal of Pharmaceutical Education for 12 years and is an editor for Pharmacotherapy, a Pathophysiologic Approach. He is also the author of Concepts in Clinical Pharmacokinetics and editor of the Encyclopedia of Clinical Pharmacy, and has published over 200 journal papers, books, book chapters, and editorials in academic and professional journals, mainly related to antibiotics, drug use and surgery, and pharmacy education. Dr. Stuart T. Haynes is a professor of pharmacy practice and Director, Division of Pharmacy Professional Development at the University of Mississippi School of Pharmacy. Dr. Haynes is the Editor-in-Chief of iForumRx.org and the Editor of Pharmacotherapy, a Pathophysiologic Approach. He has served in several elected and appointed leadership positions in national organizations and on numerous editorial boards and authored more than 100 and scholarly papers and book chapters regarding diabetes, cardiovascular disease, ambulatory care pharmacy practice models, and instructional methods. Dr. Terrence L. Schwinghammer is Professor Emeritus at the West Virginia University School of Pharmacy. Dr. Schwinghammer is a recipient of the American Pharmacist Association's Distinguished Achievement Award in Clinical Pharmacotherapeutic Practice and is a distinguished practitioner in the National Academies of Practice. He has served the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy as Chair of Pharmacy Practice Section, Chair of the Council of Faculties, and Member of the Board of Directors. In addition to authoring over 100 research and other publications, he is founding editor of the Pharmacotherapy Casebook, a patient-focused approach co-editor of the Pharmacotherapy Handbook and Pharmacotherapy Principles and Practice. Wow, I'm, this is such an honor. So now I will turn it over to Dr. DePiro. Hello everyone. It's morning here in the US, afternoon in the Middle East and evening for many of our participants. I'd like to thank you for joining us on this webinar today called Preparing Pharmacy Students for the Patient Care Process. We welcome all of our participants from many different countries, including Egypt, Oman, UAE, India, South Africa, Pakistan, and many other countries. I've been a pharmacist and pharmacy educator for 40 years and have had the great privilege to visit many of the colleagues in most Middle East countries, Gulf countries, and other places around the world. So I know that we all have a similar goal to improve pharmacy education, with the result that pharmacists are able to contribute to their fullest to the health of our societies. So it's my privilege to be here today with friends and colleagues for many years, Dr. Haynes, Dr. Schwinghammer, both are exceptional leaders in pharmacy education and practice. And we're pleased to have with us Dr. Hamza from the University of Sharjah, 
who I had the pleasure to meet here, meet there uh, during a visit a couple of years ago, and also to be supported by our excellent resource person, Dana Timmons, who you just heard from. Of all the topics we could talk about in the time we have today, most important is how pharmacy education supports the patient care process. Pharmacists have always been disadvantaged by not having a consistent patient care model, and we should all work to assure that modern pharmacy curriculum addresses this issue. We're looking forward to the discussion today and hearing your questions and comments. We know that there are high standards and great examples of pharmacy education in many countries around the world. And through this discussion, we'd like to learn more about what you're doing. Well, I'll be back uh, later in the program to speak and uh, at the question and answer session. And so now I'll turn it over to Dr. Haynes. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and, and welcome. We're so appreciative that you're all here. Um, we're going to be talking, or I'm going to be talking about the development of the pharmacist patient care process, at least as it's evolved in pharmacy education and in practice in the United States. But I don't think it's unique to the United States. I think there are uh, many issues that are, are common throughout the world about how to uh, practice and deliver patient care services. Um, in pharmacy education over the past decade or so, there have been some significant developments and it's informed our work um, in both producing the textbook pharmacotherapy, a pathophysiological approach, but also my work as an educator within my school and many of the schools, in fact, all of the schools of pharmacy in the United States. Um, this really began, I think, in the early uh, 2010s, uh, 2013, it was published the Center of Advancement for Pharmacy Education, better known in the U.S. as CAPE. Uh, this was the fourth iteration of those, that document, and in it, it outlined 15 competencies in four different domains that um, pharmacists or uh, pharmacy students should be educated regarding. Um, and one of those areas, one of those domains is direct patient care. Um, subsequent to that, uh, published was a, a statement from the Joint Commission of Pharmacy Practitioners, which represents all the pharmacy, professional pharmacy organizations in the United States, outlining what the pharmacist patient care process should be. And this became a unifying way of thinking the uh, how pharmacists should be delivering and uh, engaging in patient care that there was a, a unified systematic way of approaching patient care that all pharmacists should be using and this began to show up in other documents and one is our national licensing exam uh, part, it became part of the blueprint um, it became part of our, our accreditation standards uh, for our schools of pharmacy in which they very specifically talk about being practice ready and team ready. And uh, it also became the cornerstone of what was published in 2017 called Entrustable Professional Activities. And one of those professional activities is direct patient care and delivering on the uh, pharmacist's patient care process. Um, before we go too deeply into our discussion about the pharmacist patient care process, so I, I wanted to share with you some of the things that I talk to my students about in, in what is a practice. Um, and, and to me, there are three critical elements to think about in terms of what makes a practice. The, the first is a philosophy of practice. In other words, to have a clarity about the, the why we deliver the services that we do. And in this regard, I think pharmacy in um, the United States particularly, but other countries as well, have articulated their vision about what the philosophy of practice should be. Um, and in, in the US, we, we usually call this a pharmaceutical care. It's the cornerstone, it's a statement of declaration about our commitment to improving patient health outcomes through the appropriate use of medications. Um, the, the second part that builds a practice is not only the why, but the, the what. And the what in our case is the, the process that we'll use to deliver on our promise of our why. 
Uh, so the, the process of care, when consistently delivered, can help us achieve the why, the goal. And finally, we need systems in place to support our practice. So to support our what? The, the, and this is the where, the when, and the how, and the support systems that go around that. And there's been a lot of additional work over the last uh, decade or so around this area, the practice management system issues that need to be addressed in order for us to consistently deliver high quality care. I mentioned earlier entrustable professional activities, and this has been an important development in US pharmacy education about the specific units of work or professional practice that every student needs to um, develop while they're in school. And of course, every practitioner is uh, delegated to do uh, as part of the, their performance of their duties. Now, the entrustable professional activities go beyond just the pharmacist patient care process, but the, the cornerstone of the entrustable professional activities is um, to uh, specifically address the patient care process and deliver direct patient care. Now, the EPAs, uh, as articulated in the AACP uh, document, which is the Entrustable Professional Activities for New Pharmacy Graduates, uh, explore uh, six different um, entrustable domains, if you will, of practice. But the very first is the pharmacist patient care process. So let's talk a little bit about that. So the patient care provider domain involves the pharmacist patient care process. And as a part of that process, there are five distinct steps. Uh, and every student should, one, know what those steps are, but uh, be given practice uh, performing each of those steps. And so for the remainder part of my presentation, I'm gonna go into greater depth about each of these but the steps are collecting information that is necessary to do the assessment about the drug related uh, issues or problems. And from that, from that assessment is creating an individualized uh, plan of care that's evidence-based and cost-effective. Then the next step is actually implementing that. And there's a number of things that one has to do to implement the plan. And then finally, monitoring the patient over time through continued follow-up to determine whether the outcomes have been achieved and then reevaluating and adjusting that plan based on new information that's collected. So we're kind of going back to the collect step. Um, many of you have probably have seen this. This is the, um, the pharmacist patient uh, process wheel. Many people call it the wheel, but it, it indicates that it is a continuous process that one step leads to the next. And at the center of this process are really some of the things that are needed for practice management structure. So some of this relates to documentation systems uh, that are needed to carry out this process. Uh, certainly, we, all of the care that we provide are in, is in collaboration with other health professionals, physicians, nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists, dentists. Um, so there are a number of people that we collaborate with, and of course, with the patient themselves and their family. And then there needs to be communication structures. How do we communicate between these, uh, these individuals that we're collaborating with and also uh, documenting our care so that we are able to go back and, and determine what the plans were, what were the findings from previous visits. Uh, so those are the support structures around the care process. Um, so why is a consistent process of care even needed? And why do we, and we spend a significant amount of time in our curricula. In, in, in my school, we actually have two courses dedicated to just teaching students the patient care process. Well, uh, I think one of the reasons why we need to do, to teach a consistent process of care and, and give students practice delivering using this process of care is that we want to produce consistent outcomes. And we know that by consistently doing the same things over and over again, 
that we will produce much more consistency in the outcomes that we achieve. Uh, so applying a consistent process of care leads to better outcomes. Now, it also reduces errors. So uh, the number of errors that will happen will be reduced. And so that also improves the outcomes of care. There, there's accountability reason. So without a consistent process of care, uh, we are, you're not certain as to what uh, an individual member of the team is expected to do. And we, um, we can't attribute some actions or part of the accountability, if you will, we can't attribute it to any particular member of the team. So by pharmacists engaging in a consistent process, not only are the outcomes better, the errors lower, but there's accountability for the individual and there's more opportunities at least for attributions of the pharmacists making to the care of patients. And then there's quality assurance reasons, um, which gets to accountability and attribution. And finally, payment. Uh, so without a consistent process of care and without accountability, there really will be no payment for the kinds of services, um, direct patient care services. And so as many parts of the world, and including the United States, there's been a reliance on um, drug product delivery. So the payment is directly tied to product delivery. But when, um, for example, deprescribing is an important part of the process, when patients should be taken off certain therapies um, to improve outcomes, there's no financial remuneration for that because payment is tied to the actual product. But the kind of services that we're providing here are intended to improve the patient outcomes and, and may or may not be actually tied to particular products. So they may be centered around in the the outcomes that we're achieve, trying to achieve is better adherence to therapies or discontinuing therapies in some cases. The process of care that pharmacists deliver is unique from other health professionals. Um, now, if you look at the process of care for physicians and nursings, it actually looks quite similar. They're, all health professionals collect information, do an assessment, and develop a plan based on that information. What is unique to the pharmacist, though, is their focus, of course, on collecting information about drug use behaviors, prior drug um, history, response to drug therapy, and we have unique ways of collecting that kind of information and then assessing it. And, and the assessment is truly the unique process. We teach all of our students about the assessment process, first starting with the indication of therapy, looking at the effectiveness of that therapy, uh, addressing safety issues, and finally, uh, adherence or uh, the ability to take the medication and sometimes called convenience and cost issues as well. And they're addressed in that order. We teach our students to address them then in that order because if a therapy isn't indicated or isn't effective, um, focusing in on adherence issues is really not uh, the appropriate thing to do. Um, it's really to address the indications and effectiveness. But if a therapy is indicated and it's shown to be effective or it's being useful and it is safe in that particular patient, then of course adherence becomes one of the critical issues that we need to make sure uh, is occurring, that, that a patient is able to use the medication in an optimal manner. So let's go into each of these sections a little bit more depth. Um, the collect step is we teach all of our students to what is the relevant information that's needed to make an assessment about the medication related needs a patient has. Um, this includes information that's collected directly from the patient. So a patient interview, and we spend a significant amount of time in our curriculum talking about the patient interview process, how to do a comprehensive medication review, how to understand and collect the the patient's values and preferences is a part of that. Um, and there's a process known as motivational interviewing, which couples interviewing and collecting this information and uncovering those values and preferences. And of course, there are some physical findings that either the pharmacist collects or other members of the team collects that are important to understand the patient's response to therapy. And of course, reviewing medical records. And there are types of pieces of information that are available in patient medical records that allow us to make an assessment. So again, that are relevant to the assessment of what 
the patient's medication related needs are. So we spent a significant amount of our time in our curriculum giving students practice in doing these things and understanding what the relevant information is to the relevant problems. And with that information, they have to perform an assessment. That assessment is really centered around medication related needs. So a physician might uh, and typically does uh, do their assessment around what are the medical problems, what are the diagnoses, uh, what are the health prevention issues. And certainly our students understand how to use that. But uh, as a pharmacist, one of the things that we are charged with doing is formulating a problem list centered around the medication related issues and setting priorities around that. So this is where the assessment process of looking at indications of therapy are each uh, treatment indicated, uh, what are the clinical goals that we should be achieving with each of those medications, is it safe for the patient to be using that medication, or are, are there any um, adverse effects that are already apparent from the patient's use of it? So we haven't started the medication yet, and certainly we want to examine whether it is safe or the patient's appropriate candidate, but if the patient's already taking the medication, are there any safety issues that are emerging? or are they experiencing any adverse effects? And finally, is the patient able to use the medication or take it in an optimal manner? And that's not just taking it each day, but um, is their administration procedure correct uh, and optimal and, and things of that nature. So is the time of day that they're taking it, uh, the foods that they're taking it with, um, from those, as we begin to formulate and understand what those uh, potential issues are, we begin to formulate medication-related problems and classify those so that we have a shared understanding, a shared language about the kinds of problems that were identified during the assessment process, and we begin to prioritize those so that in, in a particular visit, uh, we may only deal with one or two of those issues. Next. Once we begin to think, and the assessment process is really an analytical process that occurs within our mind, but often we're translating those, that assessment, those who are experts are collecting, assessing, and thinking about the plan almost simultaneously. Our students are not there yet. They often have to deal with each of these kind of in separate ways. And so we often teach them, we actually teach them to do collect, we teach them to do assess, we teach them to do the plan process. In practice, though, many practitioners do, are doing all three sort of at the same time. They're, as they're collecting, they're assessing that immediately and they're beginning to formulate plans in their mind. But then this needs to be reduced to writing in some, at some point in the encounter or soon after the encounter. And so that's documenting what the medical conditions and medical medication related problems are, uh, making changes or making recommendations to changes in therapy. Uh, based on that assessment, um, specifying what monitoring parameters should be uh, um, collected during follow-up and visits, um, formulating uh, educational interventions, and usually with the family uh, and the patient, but sometimes the educational interventions may be directed to other members of the team, uh, determining who will implement each part of the care plan process and coming up uh, with a plan of when and how to follow up with the patient and or the family. And uh, all of this is, needs to be done in collaboration and coordination with other health professionals. Uh, and so teaching students how to engage in an interprofessional team as they develop these is also an important part of, of the educational process and, and care today. Uh, the next two steps are really implementing what we have written down. Um, and part of the implementation process almost invariably includes some element of patient education or caregiver education. Uh, and part of that patient education often falls to the pharmacist to do. Uh, and so we spend a lot of time in our curriculum talking about patient education, how to perform that, giving students practice at, at implementing that part of the plan, which is very critical. Um, implementing changes in therapy. So changes in either drug therapy or uh, changes in the administration of the therapy, changes in the timing of it. So all of that needs to be communicated if new drugs need to be dispensed to the patient or changes in doses and so on. 
uh, documenting that encounter, recording it in some sort of uh, medical record, as well as the implementation process and arranging for follow-up. So simply putting it in our plan isn't enough, is actually making the calls and set up any of the appointments and things like that to make sure that follow-up will occur. And finally, following up. Um, and at the follow-up is paying attention to the data that is expected to be collected. So what is the monitoring data? At what interval should that be done? Once we've collected that data, we need to make a decision. Is, do we need to make targeted refinements to the plan? Maybe we don't need to make any changes to the plan. It's working very well. The goals of therapy are being achieved. Um, and if that's the case, that's great news. Um, if there's some small adjustments that need to be made, we can do that based on a kind of a targeted follow-up and targeted plan at that point. Sometimes the data suggests that a more comprehensive evaluation of the patient's health status, particularly during transitions of care, um, that we need to do a, a complete uh, re-evaluation of the, the, the patient's care plan. And so that really feeds back into the collect stage again. So comprehensively collecting information, comprehensively assessing the patient's health status and their medication-related needs, comprehensively developing a plan. So this follow-up stage is often where we make decisions about making targeted changes or perhaps going back and starting at square one again, looking at things comprehensively. No matter what, for many patients with multiple diseases and many medications, doing a comprehensive reevaluation at least once a year is important, and it certainly is important during transitions in care. So teaching pharmacotherapeutics, and that's what the textbook is all about. That's what I do a, a lot of my time teaching pharmacotherapeutics. It's important to have an extensive knowledge of drug therapy, of course, but that's insufficient. So just being a wealth of knowledge about drugs is not going to translate it into practice. It's not going to make health outcomes better for our patients. And that's why teaching a consistent process of care, a, a consistent way of thinking about the care of patients and how we use the data and our knowledge to advance um, patient care, to make good decisions and to uh, implement it in practice is really critical. One of the things that I find with my students, and I'm sure this is true with your students, is students get lost in the details of the drugs. They often get lost in the details of the drugs. And it is important that they develop an extensive drug knowledge. There's no question about that. But they also need to step back and look at that in the context of the process. So how does the information that I know about these drugs interface with the process of care that I'm trying to implement. And that's a, why we've written the textbook the way we have. We've, we try to in, inculcate students into understanding how the process fits with each of the diseases. And we also look at how to give students repeated practice, though both throughout the didactic curriculum as well as in experiential education. And so with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Terry Schwinghammer, talk a little bit about more about how we've incorporated that into the textbook and, and followed by Dr. DePiro come back and talk about practicing um, the patient care process. And with that, Dr. Schwinghammer. All right, good morning everyone, or good afternoon or evening as the case may be. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Haynes talked a lot about the patient care process and how that fits with the, the science and the clinical aspects of uh, the textbook and other aspects of learning. So what I'd like to do today is expand a little bit on that last part that he mentioned, <clears throat> how you can use educational resources to, that have features that incorporate the patient care process. Since following this consistent process is gonna be uh, a little bit unknown to most students and to many instructors, I, th I hope these features will be useful to you as instructors as well as to students in uh, starting to develop this consistent way of taking care of patients. The two resources I'll be talking about today are the pharmacotherapy textbook and secondly, the pharmacotherapy casebook. The pharmacotherapy textbook, a pathophysiologic approach, has within it now a patient care box. This is a text box, you, know, you can locate it in, 
most chapters that are disease state based that focus on a specific disease like we're going to be talking a little bit today about hypertension and this box helps readers see the connection between the chapter content as Stuart said you know getting lost in the drugs but seeing the connection between those drugs and the drug therapy to the process of patient care now diseases throughout the pharmacotherapy textbook range from uh, very common diseases that can be treated in community pharmacy settings or clinical setting, clinic settings, to inpatient hospital settings, to critical care settings. And the beauty about the case, patient care process is it can be applied to all of these different diseases regardless of the, the setting of the disease or the complexity of the disease. Dr. Haynes talked about the, the specific steps in the patient care process, so I won't repeat that here. I just want to point out that the patient care process box in the textbook contains um, key elements about each specific disease. It's not intended to be an exhaustive list or 100% comprehensive, but rather it should serve as a learning aid for readers and they should be able to look at the patient care process box, add to it, modify it, uh, and use their learning from the textbook chapter to create their own patient care process. Remember that the box was created by the authors of the chapter and it really reflects their opinions and their recommendations. So yours or as instructors or as students may differ somewhat from what the authors have. And an important point about the patient care process box is that it refers readers back to specific sections within the textbook and certain relevant tables and figures. So that's helpful to go back and review uh, parts of the chapter if you don't understand why a, a certain uh, part of the process box appears. In the next couple of slides, I'd like to use an example of some of the content in this patient care process box. And I'll use the example for management of hypertension. And I wanna stress that what I have on the slides here is only a very limited selected part of the patient care process box. What is in the textbook is much more comprehensive than this. <clears throat> so the first step is to collect information. So the reader must consider uh, what information is needed to assess and manage a patient with hypertension. So certainly you'll need patient data, uh, the patient's history, uh, any home blood pressure readings they might have taken, medications and their prior experience with antihypertensive drug use, as well as objective data. And here it refers again, go back to the chapter and look at the clinical presentation box. What are the signs and symptoms of hypertension? What is found on physical exam? What laboratory tests are done? How are vital signs important in assessing this patient? In the assessment step then, for hypertension, you, you might look at the information and say, does this patient have any compelling indications that would bode for a specific type of drug? Do they have coronary or artery disease? So maybe a beta blocker would be useful. Do they have diabetes? So maybe they should be on an ACE inhibitor. And this refers the reader back to a, a figure that has an algorithm for treatment of compelling indications. Does the patient have complications of hypertension, such as albumin in the urine, ophthalmic complications, again, referring to the clinical presentation box. Are they taking any medications that could worsen hypertension? How close are they to reaching their desired blood pressure goal? We refer here to the goals section of the desired outcomes, the goal blood pressure for treatment box in the chapter. And then also is the current drug regimen therapy the patient receiving uh, appropriate and effective? <clears throat> In the plan step, and this is one step that in real life does require, as Stuart mentioned, collaboration with the patient, caregivers, and other healthcare professionals. Non-drug therapy is important, so for hypertension, lifestyle changes, diet, exercise, weight control if obese would be considered, drug therapy regimens, what should be continued, what should be stopped, what should be started, this refers to tables of drugs, doses, durations, special population considerations in the textbook chapter. 
what monitoring parameters for efficacy, blood pressure, uh, effect on cardiovascular events, parameters for safety, such as adverse drug effects, and time frame should be considered in creating the plan. And finally, what does the patient need to know, including how they can self-monitor their blood pressure, their heart rate, uh, and their weight at home? <clears throat> In the implementation step, which also requires collaboration, you would educate the patient about all the elements of the treatment plan and schedule follow-up and the timing of visits. In the monitoring and evaluation step, the first thing is to determine how close the patient is to achieving their goal hypertension, or their goal blood pressure, whether they're experiencing any adverse effects or whether they have any cardiovascular events or whether they're developing impaired renal function and what their level of adherence is to the patient care plan. So that is a quick overview of how the patient care process box within the disease-based chapters of the pharmacotherapy textbook can be used by as instructors to have students read this, add to it, modify it, and uh, apply the scientific and clinical content of the textbook to the patient care process. The second resource I'd like to discuss briefly is the pharmacotherapy casebook. Now the casebook is also available on Access Pharmacy and the purpose of the casebook is to present realistic patient cases to promote applications of that scientific and clinical context to clinical practice. So the casebook is a companion to the pharmacotherapy textbook. It has organ systems that are identical really that correspond to the organ system sections of the pharmacotherapy textbook. The casebook has 157 different patient cases with comprehensive medical histories, physical exams, laboratory tests, and other diagnostic tests. And they vary from simple cases with maybe one straightforward to disease to very complex cases, uh, maybe a critical care case and a patient has multiple comorbidities. And each case is labeled with its label of complexity. So as an instructor, if you're losing for, looking for something simple for the students to start at, you can look for a level one case. If they're hand, able to handle more complex cases, later in the curriculum, you might look for a level three case. And the case the new for this new 11th edition that was just published is we changed the way the questions are asked after the cases that they now follow the patient care process. So this again is much more consistent with the setup of the pharmacotherapy textbook. If you haven't used the case book before, there's a variety of ways that it can be used. You can assign uh, small groups of students, a specific case to study outside class and answer the questions that are asked, or you can use it for in-class discussion. You can have them read the chapter the case beforehand and come to class as individuals and be prepared to discuss each question that follows the case information. So this, the case book develops a consistent approach to identifying, preventing, and resolving uh, drug therapy problems. And it helps develop a consistent approach because all of the questions that follow each case are the same, regardless of the disease state. The same questions are asked. So Stuart referred to practice, practice, practice. And that's how you get good at it, is answering the same questions, regardless of the disease state. And I'd like to point out that instructor materials are available on request to instructors um, by uh, contacting user services at McGraw-Hill. The first step in the uh, continuing example of the hypertension case is collecting information. What information do I need to know about this patient to assess and manage hypertension? So the first question is, what subjective and objective information indicates that the person has hypertension? So you look at the patient complaints, the review of systems, their medication history, or they're taking antihypertensive medications. And objective information, of course, is physical exam, lab data, other diagnostic tests. After 
the reader is convinced that yes, the patient has hypertension, what additional information is needed to fully assess the patient's hypertension? If you look at the casebook, you'll note that for many cases, not all of the necessary information is provided. The reader is expected to think, not just use what's in front of them, but think, what is missing? What else do I need to know before I make a full assessment and recommendations for treating this patient's hypertension? Assessing the information then, the first thing is, what is the severity of this patient's hypertension based on the information I have available? What is the current blood pressure reading, for example? What is this patient's stage of hypertension? Based on the evidence, does the patient have cardiovascular, renal, or ophthalmic complications? After that, then, this is a really important step, and Stuart talked about this at length, create a list of the patient's drug therapy problems and prioritize them. For each of them, assess the appropriateness of the medication, its effectiveness, its safety, and whether the patient is able to take, take the medication. Now, although you may be reading a, ch a chapter and doing a case on hypertension, most cases in the casebook, the patient has comorbidities or other drug therapy problems. They may have diabetes with medications. They may have obesity as a problem that could interfere with medication effectiveness. They may have drug interactions. They may be experiencing side effects. So students need to also not just focus on the hypertension, but in a holistic approach, make a list of and prioritize all of the drug therapy problems that the patient has. And I've found that students have trouble creating drug therapy problems. In fact, some instructors have problems with this as well. So I thought I'd take a few minutes and define what a drug therapy problem statement is. You must identify clearly what the problem is. So a drug therapy problem statement includes two things, a medical condition or health issue, like a disease, hypertension, and there has to be a problem related to that drug therapy. The statement needs to be specific and detailed, but it also has to be short. One sentence is best. Has to be something that's readily understood by others, other healthcare providers who might read your recommendations, for example. Here are several examples of different kinds of drug therapy problem statements that I took from the case book that I thought were well written. A patient has established rheumatoid arthritis, established meaning greater than six months. They have high disease activity, a disease activity 28 score of greater than 5.1, and they're inadequately treated with methotrexate therapy. So this is an awesome statement because it indicates that a disease duration, its severity, and the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of the current drug therapy. Second example is dyslipidemia that requires a change in the statin therapy because of a drug interaction with simvastatin and verapamil. Um, verapamil can in increase simvastatin levels, and the dose of the statin is too low, inappropriate statin intensity. The third example is allergic rhinitis treated with an inappropriate drug, diphenhydramine, causing a sec uh, uh, excessive sedation. So this is a case of wrong drug. The previous example was a case of a drug interaction and dose too low. The last example is a patient experiencing recurrent falls, probably to one or more of the medications that they're taking, diphenhydramine, metoprolol succinate, and donepezil. So this is adverse drug reaction uh, potential and potential drug interactions here. So those are good drug therapy problem statements. I think it's a good a great in-class exercise if you're working through a patient case to have students create a drug therapy problem statements like these. Now they can do them individually. Uh, you could have them work for 10 minutes in a small group in class and say, let's write a drug therapy problem statement for this patient's heart failure or lipid control or whatever it might be. Or you could do it as a group in class as one large group. So think about that if you're looking for in-class exercises I think that's a, a useful one to get students in the habit of writing good drug therapy problem statements. 
Next section, the question three, is to develop a patient care plan. And before developing a plan, the first thing you have to do is identify what your goals are. Are you looking to cure the patient? Are you looking to relieve their symptoms or slow the disease progression, uh, as in a case like rheumatoid arthritis? And of course, consider first non-drug therapies that might be useful. They're, again, exercise, diet, uh, Weight loss might be helpful for hypertension. And the third sub-question is, what therapy options that are feasible for this patient's hypertension? Students too often just tend to pick the first drug that comes to mind or the high, most highly recommended drug, but that in many cases is not appropriate. You first need to consider the patient's situation, uh, the comorbidities they have, the disadvantages and advantages that each drug or drug class might offer for that specific patient before deciding on a specific drug regimen. So it's really important not to skip this step. Only after you've considered all of the feasible option should then a specific drug regimen be created, an individual team-based plan for each drug therapy problem with specific doses, drugs, schedules, and durations of therapy. Implementing the care plan, as Stuart mentioned, involves uh, informing the patient uh, about the disease state and what they need to know to make sure that they can adhere to it and so you can achieve successful therapy and minimize adverse effects. And this, this step is also a, an important step that we added to the casebook this edition is describe how care should be coordinated with other healthcare providers. You'll find that students have difficulty with this also because they haven't had a lot of experience working with other healthcare providers. So it's not just tell me who else is involved in the patient's care. It's not just uh, who will teach the patient about the disease, who will teach the patient about diet and exercise, who will prescribe the meds, who will educate the patient about the medications. That's all important and needs to be included in this answer. But also important is how is this care documented? And most important of all is how does the healthcare team communicate with each other as a team to deliver comprehensive, integrated, team-based care. So think about this and work with your students so they can get themselves into thinking about an interprofessional uh, mindset when they develop their drug therapy plans. And the follow-up and monitor step is identifying the clinical parameters, the you know, physical exam, signs and symptoms, and laboratory parameters that are used for two things, to identify whether you're achieving the desired outcome and to make sure you prevent or detect adverse events. And the last question is now develop a plan for follow-up that includes appropriate time frames to assess a patient's progress. So you need to consider if I'm starting a new drug for hypertension, how long will it take to I really see an effect on the blood pressure? If I'm starting a new drug that has potential serious side effects, what are they and how and when should I start monitoring for those side effects? Uh, that concludes my presentation and I hope this brief overview of how these two educational resources use the patient care process. I hope it's helpful to you in your own learning as you read these chapters, as you work through patient cases, and also to help students to ultimately become competent patient care providers in a team-based environment. Thank you very much. And I will now turn it over to Dr. DePiro. Thank you, Cherry. What I'm going to do in the time, uh, my time here is connect what uh, Stuart and Terry have talked about in the patient care process to pharmacy practice experiences. For many years, I was a clinical pharmacist in general surgery service and always had students. And I think back to those times, many hundreds of students, and 
what uh, we would do in terms of pharmacy practice experiences. And I think with what we've learned now over the years, uh, our faculty who are teaching in these areas are doing a much better job of this in applying um, aspects of it, such as the, the uh, patient, uh, the pharmacist patient care model. So the practice experiences uh, are often thought of as a capstone to pharmacy education and it's much more than clinical. Sometimes we hear the word clinical experiences, uh, but, but it goes much more beyond that. And so we don't always use the term or we try to avoid the term just clinical experiences because the practice uh, is sometimes uh, clinical or patient oriented and sometimes involves uh, many other aspects of practice. Uh, goals for our practice experiences, you can see listed here that range from uh, observing pharmacists, applying their knowledge, uh, actually implementing or gaining the experience themselves by doing. We all know that uh, the best way to learn is by doing oneself rather than, um, than observing or sitting in a classroom and hearing about how practice is done. And so in this way, uh, through practice experiences, students are developing judgment, they're gaining uh, competence and confidence that will allow them to be good practitioners as uh, after they graduate. But also um, the practice ex experience is very important for developing professional behaviors. And this can be part of the discussions that happen with preceptors. Certainly it's by observing good professionals, pharmacists and other healthcare providers in, in uh, patient care settings. Uh, learning how to work with other healthcare professionals is um, in increasingly recognized as an important part of practice experiences and working uh, within uh, team care. And so what we're, what we're all trying to do through practice experiences is assure that our graduates are practice ready. And uh, we often find that through practice experience, uh, our students get a good sense of what they want to do after they graduate in their pharmacists and often get, uh, get interested in new areas of practice that they didn't realize that they were interested in before. So practice experiences uh, clearly can happen in a lot of different environments from hospitals and clinics, um, also obviously community pharmacies and uh, many other types of settings. So we're we're, you know, we're thinking about all those different types of settings, but really focusing on those where there's interaction with patients. And we often hear that uh, students, when they complete their practice experience, and I know this was true for me, I can remember that far back, that we learn so much more from these practice experiences than we do from the traditional sitting in the classroom kinds of courses. Well, in our system, the practice experiences are divided into two general categories. It, it's not necessary that they be thought of that way, but it's the way that we have that set up where students first go into introductory practice experiences. Uh, in our case, it's 300 hours. It's usually split between community pharmacy and health system pharmacy. And, and we do think of it as an introduction. There's not enough time to be uh, proficient at the various uh, skills, where, whether they be traditional uh, pharmacist skills or patient care skills. Uh, given the limited time, they're generally not uh, uh, gaining higher level clinical skills. And so uh, we think that, that initially students in the practice experiences ought to understand how how pharmacies work and how pharmacists uh, provide their services and their care. And so um, uh, a lot of it is observational, but some of it is hands-on when it is appropriate. So sometimes it is dispensing, but again, not in, uh, uh, not in a way that I think of traditionally, but more, more patient care focused dispensing. Perhaps these experiences involve management, um, but certainly would be opportunities to develop other important skills such as communications, uh, 
involving calculations, uh, thinking about ethical issues that, that pharmacists face in healthcare, um, and a lot of other areas that can be brought into these introductory practice experiences. And, and hopefully, uh, when things go well, it really uh, enhances student interest so that they would then go back into the classroom with heightened motivation for learning and then to continue on into advanced practice experiences. And in, in our system, uh, this is 1,400 hours. So it's, it's the greater part of a year that students are in this. And um, in these advanced practice uh, experiences, there's greater emphasis on patient care uh, skills, clinical skills. Uh, and so they're, they're more apt because of the, the knowledge that they've gained in their classes to be involved in problem solving and uh, creative thinking about the issues that, that people have with their medicines. So it's intended to apply, reinforce, advance knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And that's uh, just as important, attitudes and values. And it's what we think of as professionalism, developing, developing professionalism uh, ways of thinking. Uh, I often feel like if students if, if they have the knowledge and the skills, but without the professional way of thinking, it's really kind of a waste and it, the person is unlikely to be a good pharmacist unless they're, unless they're thinking in a professional way. And also it brings in a focus on comprehensive medication management in a way that can't be done in the classroom or in the introductory experiences. Uh, and, and so we can define this comprehensive medication management is a standard of care that ensures each patient's medications are individually assessed to determine that each medication is appropriate for the patient, effective for the medical condition, safe given the other uh, patient particulars, and uh, able to be taken by the patient as intended. And so there are a lot of questions in here that we ask students to consider as they're uh, providing patient care. And so it does include an individualized patient care plan as was discussed within the uh, pharmacist care process. I think that um, thinking or having a framework for thinking about the development of our students using the Bloom's taxonomy is helpful. And I don't have time to go into this in depth, but if you were to do a Google search on Bloom's taxonomy, you'd come up with a lot of good information about, um, about this way of thinking of cognitive function. And so in practice experiences, students should advance in their way of thinking to higher levels. In the classroom, it's easy for us to uh, have students be involved in lower levels, remembering, memorizing, understanding, defining. And, and then it's really in the applying stage that, um, uh, that, that they get into within the practice experiences. Applying means taking the information that they've learned and using it in a new situation. So this would be a new patient or a new case. And then th through the practice experiences, become adept at uh, analyzing situations, um, assessing uh, and evaluating. So using judgmental skills that often there's not uh, an absolute where they've got to make uh, work in gray areas, so to speak, and making judgments. And the highest area within the taxonomy is creating. And this is more difficult to achieve in a practice experience. Sometimes we see it, for example, if a student as a special project and they're designing a new protocol or a new type of service uh, that, that they get to the highest levels. Uh, but again, it's, it's helpful to think about progression of experiences in this way. And so we get back to the patient care process. I'm not gonna repeat uh, all the good information that has been provided by Stuart and Terry. Uh, but it's important that when students learn this in the classroom and in their simulation environments, that they apply it during the uh, practice experiences. 
and to, to, they have to see it being applied, they have to be able to apply it themselves, and this reinforces, again, knowledge, skills, and behaviors, attitudes, and values. And so, uh, it really has been mentioned before, the consistency of the model is important, a consistent model for students to see and to learn from. And it helps other health professionals to understand what it is that pharmacists do. And if the question arises, yes, it is applicable in all patient care settings. And I also want to uh, emphasize uh, what, what has been discussed about entrustable professional activities because they go hand in hand, the patient care process with the EPAs. Uh, and it, it's, it's not a, a different, something different from the patient care process. Entrustable pro professional activities can be applied within the patient care process and as a way of assessing students' progress through their, uh, through, through their degree program. And so it provides actually more details about what happens at each step and again can be observed and, and assessed. So um, EPA provides a, a good framework for teaching pharmacy students. And so some examples of these, there could be many depending on the site of training, the type of care being provided, uh, these can vary considerably and they don't necessarily have to be the same in each training site. But to provide some clear examples of what EPAs are, uh, here are some, uh, collect the medication history as we've, we've talked about in the prior sections. This is an entrustable professional activity. Determine a patient's medication adherence. Identify drug interactions. And so each of these, in an assessment system, uh, a preceptor could be uh, observing the student, asking the student to demonstrate and then being able to um, certify in a way that the student has completed the activity and is competent and then uh, uh, able to move on to the next step. Maybe it's a higher level of functioning within that, that patient care setting. So, so again, this is a very useful and important way to think about how we organize uh, practice experiences. So I want to talk about approaches to experiential learning. And while the introductory experiences happen in the first few years, again, the advanced experiences typically, now in our system, would be in the final year of pharmacy education. But we can, we can apply and promote experiential learning and the patient care process throughout the whole curriculum. Yes, even in the classroom, and it should be in the classroom, where, where the instructors are um, demonstrating and speaking in a way that, that shows the use of the patient care process and sets up active learning within that classroom using the patient care process. So it can be pre-class and in-class in active learning methods where uh, students are asked to demonstrate how the patient care process is used. Then as students move through the curriculum, uh, as we have, most schools have uh, out of classroom simulation types of experiences. Perhaps they're meeting with an instructor, uh, certainly instructor oversight, typically with other students, maybe with other health, other health profession students. And in this setting, they'd have uh, patient cases, and be able to apply the patient care process. So through this, it's, it's learning about the process, but also developing these communication, interprofessional, and their patient care skills. Um, in the actual uh, practice experiences, then the next step could be observation of pharmacists using the patient care process. And then uh, in the more advanced stage, stages, actually modeling the patient care process in actual patients. And I, I'd like to bring up one point here that um, often uh, when we have patients in a patient care environment, 
and we know patient care environments can be very complex. There may be many patients on a ward. Uh, and sometimes we, we put um, an expectation on a student that they have to do so much, see so many patients, work up uh, X number of patients. And I really want to suggest that I think the um, focus on the fidelity of the model rather than the quantity of patients reviewed is most important. And what I mean by that is starting out, it's so important that um, even if the student can, can do a thorough workup in a patient care process for one patient and do it correctly, that's so much more important than not doing it correctly, but by, uh, by working up 10 patients. And so, so it's just uh, an important part of the process to make sure that initially they can do it correctly and then they become more efficient and depending on the service that they're on, apply this to more patients. Now in the setting of uh, COVID, it's become much more difficult to provide patient care experiences. I, I really wonder what's happening in other countries. Uh, here, we've had some of our uh, clinical sites, our patient care sites, uh, restrict student access or put a pause on student access. So some schools have had to go to uh, remote types of experiences which make it more difficult to, to implement a, a patient care, a pharmacist patient care model. Uh, however, what we're learning now is that there's a lot that can be done even through telehealth, telehealth and um, digital uh, types of technologies, remote technologies. And so I'd like to, to suggest that, that many people in many countries, many schools can be very creative in how the patient care pr process is applied uh, through using new types of technologies. I'd like to finish up just by talking about uh, resource needs because uh, like many things we do in pharmacy education, we do something new, it requires resources. And that's true also of uh, teaching the pharmacist patient care process. And so uh, to do this well, and this is a, uh, not something that's done easily because it's a change and people always resist change. So it takes time. I think it takes uh, the, a good reasoning for why we need to make this kind of change. And thinking about our schools, it requires faculty and a school curriculum committee that understand and support the need to teach the model and apply uh, entrustable professional activities. We have to have a sufficient number of faculty members with clinical credentials who use the practice model. Because if it's taught in the classroom, but not seen in the practice experiences or not seen by the practicing pharmacist, the students are not gonna learn it appropriately and they're not gonna apply it after graduation. So we have to have preceptors who know and use the model. Uh, and this is a difficult point for us. We're at that point now. We're working with our preceptors to get them to learn the model and to apply it. So we're, we feel like we're helping to advance practice beyond the school by developing our preceptors. There have to be healthcare facilities where the model can be implemented. And so that depends on um, uh, a variety of things, including the other healthcare professionals who we're working with. They have to become knowledgeable about the model and even administrators within a system and the, the, the um, authorities that they allow pharmacists and uh, the scope of practice, so to speak. Uh, and and it, so, so again, healthcare administrators and other health professionals who, who understand and support this model. So again, I, I hope this has been helpful in tying together the pharmacist uh, patient care model with the practice experiences that are so essential to uh, learning for our students. And I'd like to now go on and turn this back to Dana Timmons. Thank you, Dr. DePiro. And I will start sharing my screen now for everyone. Okay, so I am a user services librarian, a health sciences librarian in the user services department at McGraw-Hill. The user services department provides training and support to our customers. 
I'm going to move through these slides pretty quickly, but did want to let you know that we do offer training sessions that are more in depth. It usually takes about an hour to get through the whole site. Um, prior to joining McGraw-Hill, I was a pharmacy liaison librarian um, at a university. I've also completed a one-year fellowship at the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy. So the first thing that I like to show everyone when I start my training sessions is I just like to talk about the My Access Profile. The My Access Profile unlocks many key features on the site, including the ability to work through the cases, to create and take quizzes, to connect remotely to Access Pharmacy, so that would be off of VPN, um, off-site to bookmark your favorite content, to receive alerts whenever new content has been added to the site, and to download multiple images at once. So I do highly encourage all faculty to create a My Access profile and also encourage your students to create one. And to do that, you would just, um, when you're connected to your institutional subscription, you would just click on sign in and then you would just fill out the information. And then once you're signed in, you'll see your name, like you see my name here, next to your institutional subscription. The books are available on the homepage for quick access. There are arrows here that you can scroll through the site. And you can see here I have pointed to the 11th edition of the pharmacotherapy textbook and the, the casebook. You can also get to the books on the site uh, by clicking, clicking on books, and that will take you into the books library. And then once you're in the books library, you can see the um, books that we have talked about today that the authors have talked about are available here at the top of the books library. And then on the left side of the page, the books are filtered by category. So if you were looking for text on, um, say, drug information, you could click there to filter to all textbooks related to that particular topic. Whenever you click into one of the textbooks, you'll notice that they all have a pretty similar functionality. So you can print. Um, this now says PDF. We've made that change. Um, just this week, so you can download the PDF, but of course you could um, print the PDF as well. You can jump to a particular section. You can share, so if you click on that, that will provide you with a link to email a particular chapter. You can get a citation, and you can also search within the book. And you can add content to your favorites. That's what these stars are up here. You won't see these stars unless you're signed into the the My Access profile. And when you click to add content to your favorites, you have the option to organize that content into folders. So you could add all of the content, including things from books, any images, videos, cases that you want to use in your class or share with your class into folders so it's organized. The books and the cases have the text to speech read speaker and you can click on listen. So you would just hit that to actually listen to the page and then within the settings of read speaker and the settings are available here within this gearbox. You can change the um, color change the speed and um, so you have a lot of Hypothesis, which is up here in the upper right hand corner, is an open source browser plugin that allows users to quickly annotate and highlight content on any page. And so this allows users to collate any highlights or annotations that they've gathered across any of the access products, including Access Pharmacy, and gather them together with a variety of sources that they use on a regular basis. And they have the option to share um, so it's posted only to them or they could share this content within a group. Within each one of the chapters, you'll find a tab that shows the full chapter with all of the content. 
If you only want to view the figures or tables, you can click on that particular tab. The figures are licensed for educational use, so you can download them and use them in your classroom presentations. The source attribution is already included. You can see that here on the slide automatically, and you can add these to your favorites. And you also have the ability after if you view full size to print the images. So Dr. Schwinghammer had mentioned the cases. You'll find the cases on Access Pharmacy under the cases tab. And then you can scroll down to the pharmacotherapy casebook and care plans. Within the cases, you'll see learning objectives, the patient presentation, questions, clinical pearls, and the references. And you can see here on my the instructor guide. So as Dr. Schwinghammer mentioned, um, faculty can request that. And then you have the, the instructor guide. And user services can turn that on for you. All of the books on this site have durable URLs. And so if you wanted to share a book in your learning management system, you can copy the link and then paste that in. The chapters and sections also have durable URLs, so that makes it easy for you, again, to assign readings to the students. And the cases have durable URLs, as well as the multimedia. So you could also share a video um, or any of the lectures on the site. Dr. Haynes talked about collecting information under quick reference. You have quick answers, pharmacotherapy. And this provides concise, practical expert information on the pharmacotherapy of common disorders. And the content is derived from the leading pharmacy reference, um, pharmacotherapy, a pathophysiologic approach. We do have a drugs database that includes um, thousands of drugs. There are drug monographs on here. And the study tools, that includes uh, review questions, so students can um, set up their own quizzes, and also flashcards for self-study. We do have patient education handouts on here because educational interventions are included in the patient care plan. I wanted to show you these. Um, they are available in adult medicines and pediatric advisor. And if you're signed into the My Access profile, you can customize the handout. You could add a logo or a note that would be saved for the patient. You can search within the site and then you could filter to a book chapter or to images and you can also add terms to your search to refine that search. And there's so much great stuff on here that it's almost impossible um, again to show you everything in 10 minutes but if you're on the site and you click on support user resources that will take you into the Access User Center that the User Services Department has created. We have a lot of video tutorials on here and different documents, um, short overview of the site, and you can also view any of our archive training sessions. Great, thank you for um, viewing that quick overview. And now I am pleased to have Hamza Al Zubaidi uh, from the University of Sharga here to share a little bit about his experience with Access Pharmacy with us. Um, so delighted to have you here today. Thank you, Dana. It's great to be part of this session. So Dr. Al Zubaidi is currently working as an assistant professor of pharmacy practice at the University of Sharga. He obtained his PhD from Monash University in Australia, and his research focuses on health services research, particular, particularly in diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. So my first question for you today is, um, so you use the pharmacotherapy textbook and it's available to your students via Access Pharmacy. What course do you teach and how do you use this title? Um, thanks, Dana. So currently I'm teaching two clinical pharmacy courses for fourth year students. I teach topics like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, asthma, 
and our students are currently accessing uh, the pharmacotherapy textbook online via Access Pharmacy, and they are really enjoying it. Oh, that's great. Thank you. So how do you use the pharmacotherapy textbook and Access Pharmacy to prepare lectures or set work for students? And what do you like most about it? So Access Pharmacy is really kind of an excellent platform and it has, as you just showed us, like many wonderful resources. I mainly use the pharmacotherapy textbook. I used it back in the day when I was a student and now I'm using it heavily when I prepare my lectures. It's really a great textbook. It's very easy to navigate, especially the electronic version. It's very, it's comprehensive with a very clear structure. So the question, how do I use it in preparing um, lectures? Well, I start by looking at the learning objective and then I select what's appropriate for this part of the world. And then I go on to create the content accordingly. And then at the end of the topic, I might use some of the self assessment questions at the end of the lecture, really kind of just to measure and gauge how the students understanding of the topic. That's great, thank you. So do you use cases in your teaching? Yes, I use a lot of um, cases in my teaching. Really, I think cases are a wonderful way to improve the students' problem solving and critical thinking. Typically, at the end of any topic, for example, hypertension, I would post a case study on the Blackboard platform and ask the students to really kind of answer specific questions related to that topic. Then I would monitor their responses and identify what they've got right or what are the areas that they missed, and it will provide some feedback on the responses. Sometimes I post a case before this, the class as activity and ask the student just to consider the case and come prepare just for what's the lecture going to be all about, and that will be very helpful in the teaching process. And then I will solve the case at the end of the class. That's great. It sounds like you are using a lot of the, the features and the functionality that I, um, that I demonstrated. Are there any features yes. of Access Pharmacy which have been um, particularly helpful for studying? Yes, Dana. So um, you you just touch base on the audio tool, the read speaker uh, function. And I think that lots of our Arabic speaking students, they find it particularly helpful with um, difficult diseases and medication. It really helped them with the pronunciations. And over the past two years, our students are increasingly using the pharmacotherapy textbook and they loved several features of it, namely the downloadable um, tables and figures. And they find that that's very easy for them to print and sort of to put their notes on them. And they like that it's actually very comprehensive. They don't need to search anything additional for the pharmacotherapy and the drugs. Um, so yes, um, and some of my colleagues use other sort of uh, features of the Access Pharmacy like the multimedia and the videos. And they said it's particularly helpful in pharmacology and um, the self the study tools like the flashcards and the cases. I myself, I haven't used the pharmacotherapy casebook, but I'm very, very interested to keep using them because it's very, very structured just from uh, Prof. Terry, what showed us today in the presentation. Fabulous. I'm glad to hear that the students are, are using the images. That's something I always say, you know, beware of getting them from Google because of copyright violations. So that's, that's really great to hear all of that. Um, so from watching today's speakers, do you see the pharmacist patient care process as a growing hot topic in the UAE and surrounding countries? Most well, certainly. There is a growing interest in the UAE and I think in the region actually to move away from the traditional role of dispensing and tr trying really to kind of like widen the scope of practice. So teaching the patient care process is very timely and very relevant to the way we teach the practice at the moment. And really after listening to the eminent professors today, I most certainly would want to focus more on the patient care process in my upcoming lectures. The, the only challenge remain, however, is that when there is a gap out in the practice and when they perhaps will not be able to see the implementation of the process uh, in their practice sites. But most certainly I would want to focus more on the patient uh, care process model uh, in the coming lectures. Well, thank you so much, Dr. al Zubaidi, for being here with us. Um, that was very helpful. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Tapiro. 
Thank you, Hamza and, and Dana. Uh, now we have some time for questions, and I want to thank you for submitting questions. I apologize at the start here that we probably won't have the time to get to all the questions, but we'll do our best. And so I'm starting at the top with the question that was posed and had the most uh, likes. Uh, what is the main difference between clinical pharmacist role and nurses role and what is the situation of community pharmacists from that? So two part question, both that, that relate to the uh, pharmacist patient care model. Uh, as you know, nurses have many different roles, as, as many different types of functions as, as pharmacists have. So it depends on what type of nurse, but uh, having a uh, a defined pharmacist care model will make this clear and that's why perhaps there's been some uh, confusion about what pharmacists can can do to enhance um, and work along with nurses uh, in a word clearly it's a focus on the patient and medications and while it involves other aspects um, it's it's that focus in a comprehensive medication management that doesn't typically happen within a nurse's role. I'm gonna ask uh, our other speakers to comment on this as well, but I, I'll just uh, also say that um, all that we have talked about in terms of the patient, uh, the, the pharmacist patient care model, and when we talk about clinical pharmacists, yes, this is uh, completely applicable to the community setting. Now we know there, uh, this varies from country to country, and the authorities and um, what uh, information pharmacists have. So sometimes a pharmacist will need to collect the information directly from the patient rather than if they don't have access to a hospital record or a clinic record, but the process can be the same in a community as well as a hospital or a clinic setting. And I'd like our other speakers to uh, address these issues as well. Um, I was going to just reiterate the, the focus on medications really is the key, um, I think, distinction between pharmacists and the other professions. And I think using an assessment process that is consistent, you know, looking at the indications for each medication, looking at the safety issues with those medications, the effectiveness in that particular patient case, and the patient's ability to use the medication in the optimal manner. Um, and so, there is overlap. There's no question that there's overlap between members of the healthcare team. Uh, and that's part of why a team needs to get together and talk about the plan together. And uh, if, it, if it's possible to do it face to face or to come to some understandings about roles and responsibilities. Uh, certainly nurses do a lot of patient education as well. Uh, the focus may be on other things, lifestyle issues, other social determinants, uh, caregiver things, and the pharmacist may either comprehensively deal with all the medications or maybe only certain medications. Um, and so that's a discussion that happens between the members of the team, I think. I'd just like to say, thank you, Stuart, uh, a few words about community pharmacy practice. There is really a resurgence in uh, clinical practice in community pharmacies. Uh, many uh, pharmacy students now go on to do residencies in community pharmacy practice. And when they complete those residences, they're fully capable of taking care of individual patients. They make specific appointments with patients. They see on them on a returning basis. They may, they, manage, they may manage specific aspects or specific common chronic diseases like anticoagulation, diabetes, uh, you name it, on down the line. And the key point is that they develop a relationship with the patient. They follow the key process. And in some cases, they are referred patients from physicians to manage. So they document what they do. And if it's something that can be completed and uh, the patient is taken care of, they, they not only keep the physician informed of the patient's progress, but they refer that patient back to the physician if, uh, if the pharmacist's job is done. So there's a lot going on now in community pharmacy practice. Dr. Hamsa, anything to add? If not, we can move to the next question, but feel free to jump right in there. No, I think you've covered it very well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the next question that had a lot of likes, uh, I would like to know how much emphasis a pharmacist should give about factors other than medications 
like diet, lifestyle, while counseling patients. And while we've just emphasized medications, it, it, you, it, they can't be separated from these factors. And I'd like to go back to Dr. Haynes because his experience in diabetes is sort of a classic example to give insight as to how these other factors come into uh, the pharmacist's approach. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously pharmacists need to be, have some working knowledge of all of these issues because the medications are taken within a context and lifestyle issues and other behaviors that a patient have certainly will influence the outcomes of care, right? So pharmacists need to have some working knowledge of this. I have a working knowledge of the nutritional issues related to uh, you know, patients with diabetes. But I will say is I don't, certainly my skill set is not to do a comprehensive evaluation of someone's nutritional needs or their dietary habits. Um, I can do a superficial you know, examination of that, and I certainly talk about some of the key issues. But within a diabetes context, for example, I worked in a diabetes care team, and we had dietitians, and they did the comprehensive assessment, and I looked at their notes, and I understood what the goals were. And so it was really in that team approach. So yes, I have a knowledge. Yes, I speak to those issues. I try to reinforce parts of the plan, uh, but I did not see it as my role, nor did I have the expertise to comprehensively and in depth deal with those issues as some other members of the team are better prepared to do, just as I'm better prepared to deal with the medication issues. Thank you. So we have another question that's risen to the top here. And it, let's see, how well can a pharmacist make a difference in the field of cardiovascular research? And if it's okay, I'd like to extend that question to cardiovascular research and practice. And so we do in, in our settings, each of our institutions have um, clinical pharmacists who are in the cardiovascular area and uh, applying the patient care process, but also very, very much involved in clinical research um, setting up trials. I, I think thinking of some examples now at my institution where it's the pharmacists who are the primary people setting up clinical trials to uh, investigate new therapies for various types of cardiovascular diseases. So uh, acquiring the training and how to set up, how to do cardiovascular research, I think there's a tremendous opportunity. I'd like to turn back to our other speakers as well. So can I share one example from this part of the world, if possible? So um, within the very much limited scope of practice within the community, that was the case for many years ago, we are witnessing sort of some expansion within the cardiovascular sort of research and sort of involvement in pharmacists in doing that. And one example that I would like to share is the screening for cardiovascular risks, which we've been able to train some of the pharmacists to provide those basic sort of uh, absolute cardiovascular risk screening and being able to refer those at high risks for further management with physicians. And we've got some great um, research outcomes in a small, as well as great service setup, if you like. So uh, I think, yeah. So just even within the small sort of like, uh, just as screening as a basic things within the community pharmacy is an area of research and area of service that's happening. And, and most certainly we are witnessing also some pharmacists taking more advanced role in outpatient um, clinics and managing heart failure clinics. And we are seeing a lot of expansion within this part of the world, which is very exciting. Thank you, Hamza. We're gonna finish up with the last question because it's so relevant to all of us around the world. Uh, because of COVID-19, how can a student uh, do pharmacy experience, which includes interaction and communication with a patient and the health profession, uh, does the student in a virtual training gain the competency as in comparison when it was all live face-to-face -face last year? Um, well, yes, it is happening. We have, have uh, caregivers, pharmacists, um, patient-focused pharmacists who are doing now remote care, uh, telehealth care, uh, Zoom appointments, and they are involving students. So it is possible, but I'd have to say we're, we're learning now how to do this. I, I'm not confident to tell you it is as good as what we did when it was all live face-to-face, -face, but I think we're just at the initial point in learning 
how to do this, how to bring students into this process when there's remote care being given. And I, I think we will learn how to do that. And, and as I said before, I think this is an opportunity for all pharmacists around the world to contribute to the knowledge and the experience. There, now there's no uh, one country that has more experience than another. We're all learning together at the same time how to do this. And so I think we should um, experiment with different teaching methods as we're, as we're doing the same for different care methods. And, um, and we'll learn what works best. Uh, so I'd like to ask our other speakers to comment on this as well. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I would say, so uh, I practiced in the Veterans Administration in the United States, which is a series of hospitals for veterans, uh, obviously, of the U.S. And uh, they've been using telehealth for a long time, actually, for a couple of decades to deliver care to people that are remote to their hospitals. It is a different skill set. Um, and so we're all out having to learn how to deliver care to people who are remote. Um, I think it's a very valuable skill set to have. You, the encounters are, need to be progressed differently. There's certain information you can't collect. For example, it's, you, know, you can't do a physical exam remotely yet. Uh, we don't know how to do that. But certainly the interview process needs to be conducted a little bit differently. Uh, the pre-encounter. You know, so there's certain things that just need to be done differently, and we're still learning those best practices. But I think it's a terrific opportunity to students to learn those best practices because Clearly, remote delivery of care is going to be increasing over time. Our patients want it, they expect it, and it makes access to care for people who live in remote areas much more feasible. Thank you. And I'll just add that in June, the User Services Department hosted a webinar um, with a pharmacy faculty member who talked about her experience shifting her um, pharmacy, the experiential rotations into a virtual format. And so I'll share that in the chat as well. Thank you. Well, we're over time. So we appreciate your patience with us and being here today, all of the participants. Uh, it's been an enjoyable experience from my, my standpoint. I hope that you all found it interesting and valuable. And so we'll close at this point and I'll turn it back to uh, Dana Timmons. All right, well, thank you, Dr. DePiro. Thank you to all of the panelists and thank you to all of the attendees. These were some wonderful questions. Um, you will receive a certificate and you also um, share the recording. You'll receive that soon. Also at the very end of this webinar, a survey will appear. So please do take the time to complete that survey. Thank you all again and have a wonderful day.